It's my great pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to address you this morning. I do want to get started with a couple of recognitions of my own. Um, another round of applause for our morning's uh, opening, the native recognition, and all of the folks who have greeted us this morning so far and really set the stage for what we're going to engage in today. I would be remiss if I did not celebrate um, the presence of William, who's been helping me with all my PowerPoint. Clap for William Hardaway. As while you're clapping, please clap for Jamal, who's been working very hard. And all of the team in the back, thank you to all of you. Um, everyone who participated in registration and making sure that all of the travel arrangements and hotels, that everything's necessary for what we're gonna do today. <clears throat> now, I have a little bit of time to talk with you about some really important um, topics. What I hope to do is to spend some time underscoring our focus on mentoring and what does it mean to be a mentor. I want to talk with you about some life goals and lessons that you might set for yourself as a protege or even as a mentor who's working with proteges. I want to do it in a way that really underscores the importance of education because I think education is critically important to um, the success and well-being of everyone, but certainly it plays a critical role in today's time for young men, especially young men of color. And then I want to also close in a way that really connects all of the themes that I talk about this morning. I want to do all of that in the time that I have with you that will keep you entertained, also keep you um, informed, and keep your attention. Those are my three goals, to do something that will keep you entertained, and at the end you'll laugh or you might cry, you might do something during this talk. The second is to do it in a way that you don't think, oh, that was fun only, but you also leave provoked. Um, when I gave my first TED talk, I remember that the TEDx uh, group had each author's or presenter's name on their web page. Each name was followed by three descriptors. What you may not know by looking at that website is the three descriptors that are under my name, I did not select. They selected them for me. The first one was 1P Professor. And that was important for me because I'm a vice president right now at a college in Memphis, Tennessee, but at my core, what I see myself as is a professor. A professor, by definition, is one who professes something, but a professor's job is to teach. So whether I'm um, you know, cracking jokes or writing books or giving public lectures, I see myself as an educator. My job is to teach us something today. That's the first P. The second one that they gave me, apart from being a professor was they also put a P and that was that I was a performer and I didn't really know myself to be a performer. They had a slash beside that and it said preacher. You may not know this, but I'm out of a church sort of context. I am a licensed preacher in my own religious tradition and I think in many ways the professor and the preacher come together in these kind of talks and take turns who's going to take the stage. The third one was one that I didn't really appreciate until years later. It was not only did they call me a professor and a performer or a preacher, but they call me a provocateur. A provocateur is a person whose goal is to provoke thought. You have to instigate per, uh, thought, but the way you do it is by troubling people's existing thoughts, beliefs, practices, and behaviors. So part of my assignment today is not just to stand here and give you a couple of thoughts and um, feel good sort of messages, but it's also to do some stuff that will trouble the way that we think about mentoring, trouble the way that we think about education and even provoke us to think in new and different ways. So I wanna do that over the next couple of slides. Um, apart from being vice president at Lemoyne Owen College, I also own a consulting company, Do Good Work Educational Consulting. Um, if you are on social media, I invite you to connect with me. I am T.L. Strayhorn on all things social media. Um, my consulting firm is Do Good Work on all things social media. So feel free to connect on Instagram and Facebook and um, Twitter, all those places. But also, if um, we have time for questions, I'd invite you to um, raise questions with me in this session, but usually in keynotes like this, especially in large spaces like this, you can't really have that kind of intimate back and forth in Q&A. So if you have a question or a thought or something that I say provokes you to a point where you want to share, I invite you to take a picture of this slide and shoot me an email and write those questions or those thoughts or reactions and I'll promise to get back to you 
in short order. order. Um, so the way we're going to start today is to think about what our goal is. Our goal, this is a conference. The definition of the word conference is a gathering of like-minded individuals over a certain period of time. Conferences have two objectives. That is, it's a gathering of like-minded individuals. You can't tell. This is the tallest I've ever been in my entire life. I'm five, six and a half, and the half is important for me. But some of you in here might be six and a half. You might be six, five. You might be five, one. You might be four, ten. Whatever it is, we are of different heights and different weights. Looking around the room, I don't know everyone's race, but phenotypically, we all look different. Some lighter hues, some darker hues, some with natural twisted hair, some with straight and blonde hair, some with glasses, some without glasses. There's enormous diversity in this room. But interestingly enough, the purpose of this conference is to bring together very different people who are like-minded. What brought us together, as MC Troy said earlier, all together on a Saturday is, believe it or not, this theme, mentoring, brought us here. It was enough, despite our racial differences and our class differences and our educational backgrounds that are different, it was enough to say, you know what, but I have something to say or something to learn about mentoring. I'm interested in that. And what brought us to this room is our commitment and our shared interest in the term mentoring. We're here over an extended period of time. I've got some time with you this morning, but if you look in the program, we've got a whole day full of sessions and other speakers and performances. Conference is a gathering of like-minded individuals over an extended period of time, but it has two purposes. First, we come together to reach consensus. That is, if this conference is successful, we've got to agree to some stuff. That is what mentoring is and what mentoring is not. Mentoring is not automatic. It's not something that you can manufacture and mix together. I, you can't tell, because I'm only five, six and a half, about 130 pounds, depending on the day. I'm vegan now, so maybe like 120 pounds. But still, this is about the heaviest I've ever been in my life and about the tallest I've ever been. But you can't tell by looking at me, but I am the beneficiary of 62 mentoring programs. I've been a part of at least 62 of them. Now the problem with that is, you would think, whatever you think about mentoring, that if I had been, a, 62 was a lot of programs. That if I've, in my whole life, if I've been a part of 62 mentoring programs, Seems to me I would be taller or maybe heavier or like, I don't know, something cool. I would walk on water. I don't know. What is it that we expect from mentoring programs that the beneficiary would get and it would show up in me? You know, I still I put my clothes pants on the same way anybody else does. So the question we're going to play with during this keynote is one, what is mentoring and what is it that we expect it to do for the protege? And what evidence do we have that it does anything at all? I believe it is effective, but I don't think all mentoring programs are effective. I remember being a part of a mentoring program and I hated my mentor. And I think my mentor hated me. I don't know because we never had meaningful engagement. It was something that someone who was running the program took a list of young men and matched it with the list of older men and put us together and introduced me to a guy and said, hey, Terrell, this is my mentor. And that mentor took me to lunch, sat me down, talked to me for an hour about what he did back in the 50s when I was not alive, what he did in the 60s for the second time when I was not alive. And half the stuff he was telling about I wasn't interested in, I didn't desire to do. And I sat there for about an hour and a half and then the dinner was over. I was so glad when it was over. And then he said, and guess what? If you're lucky, I'll take you back to dinner again some other day. I thought, if I'm lucky, I'll never respond to you again. But if you're not careful, most mentoring programs operate that way. We run mentoring programs looking for willing men who want to mentor. We have no desire, no information about their impact on young people, their interest in young people, their background with young people. And then we get young men who we say, how many of you want to mentor? We know nothing about their willingness to engage and participate and be a part of the program. We just think if you have a program and match people up, it's going to automatically work. We're going to trouble that a bit in our time this morning. But to do it, we're going to do it in a way that keeps us all engaged. So to do this, I need everyone to stand up. Everyone stand, everyone stand. 
And if you are at a table with someone, that's great. But if you're at a table by yourself, you got to move over and get near a table with someone. And what I need you to do is when you're ready, just extend your hands in front of you like this, both hands in front of you like this. And <clears throat> then while your hands are extended, get close to someone else because what you're going to do is you're going to take, we need to do this all the way around, you're going to take one finger and place it in the palm of the person beside you. There it is. And then, I mean, you could do it that way. Yes, if you're doing, yeah, you got to get your other finger in his palm. There you go. We're going to do it in dyads all across the room. You got it, you got it, you got it, you got it. You, this is very awkward, yes. That's, it's intended to be awkward. Okay, good. All right, so now that you have your finger inside each other's palms, um, I want you to look at each other eye to eye and say good morning. Because you probably haven't done that, though you were sitting beside them for dozens of minutes, right? All right, so on the count of three, this is called catch and release. The goal of this is one, when I count to three, simultaneously, you're trying to catch their finger with your one hand while freeing your own finger from their hand. So you got to try to catch their finger while breaking your finger free on the count of three. You can do this. Now, remit, clearly the opposite is true. The other person is trying to catch your finger while they're getting their finger free. So we all have the same goal, like-minded individuals coming together at this conference on the count of three, only on the count of three. Your goal is to catch their finger, not break their finger. You ready? One, two, three. Ah, I see, I see, I see. All right, give yourselves a hand. That's great. You may take your seats. <clears throat> and really, the only purpose of that activity is to get you up and moving. Because it turns out when you get people up and moving and laughing, the energy changes in the room. What I want to talk to you about is what is a mentor. The term mentor is a term that we borrow from Greek mythology. How many of you in here by a show of hands has, have ever read or heard about Homer's book, The Odyssey? In The Odyssey, there's a young man by the name of Telemachus. Telemachus has an older, gen Telemachus is on a journey trying to figure out who he is and what his, his powers are. And he's guided in this journey called life by an older guy who's called Mentor. Mentor is the advisor, the coach to Telemachus in Homer's book, The Odyssey. We use that term now to refer to mentors and mentoring and mentoring programs. But interestingly enough, mentors are guides. They are aides, supporters of students, designed to be more like coaches than parents. What is a mentor? A mentor is a coach or a guide. The other thing we learn about mentor in Homer's book is this, that mentor knows where Telemachus must go. From his own experience, he draws from his experience to share with Telemachus examples and stories and advice based on his own experience. He's not going where Mentor went because Mentor knows he has his own life, his own path, his own why. But he learns from his own life experiences how to coach Telemachus through his own journey. The purpose of a mentor is not to have um, Xerox copies of themselves or duplicates of themselves, but it's to be a guide, to draw from their life experiences to inform the decisions of their protege. The hardest part of being a mentor is trying to understand that it's about coaching and it's about advising and it's about giving um, information. It's not about ownership of another person's body. This is what we learn about mentoring from the story of mentor to aid a young person. Now, interestingly enough, mentors don't have to be numerically older than their protege. I have lots of mentees or proteges who are older than me. But really what qualifies one to be mentors, not their age, is their experience. And it requires a calculation of is there something about the mentor's experience that the protege either wants to learn or should learn in order to prepare them for their life journey? Is there something about the mentor's life experience 
that the protege either wants to learn or needs to learn that will equip them, prepare them for their life's journey. All of us in here have been parts of mentoring programs and those mentoring programs or mentors have often left us with good pieces of advice, experiences and opportunities. In fact, if you had time to sit around and talk about this to each other, you would learn that not only have you, has this conference brought together like-minded people over an extended period of time, but some of us have different mentors who offered us similar lessons. Different mentors, but similar lessons. The job of a mentor to me is really to be just like me as a professor, an educator. It's not just to be someone that students can call or protégés can call when they have questions. It's not just someone who can help them get a job or write them a cover letter or I'm sorry, not a reference, a reference letter. But a job of a mentor is really to educate, to inspire. But part of education requires what we call cognitive dissonance. It is to disrupt current ways of thinking and knowing and calling the individual to a higher level or a higher plane. Said differently, the job of the mentor is to challenge the protege. So if a mentor is always affirming and always celebrating their protégés, I would argue that mentor is not being effective. Every now and again, the mentor must challenge. I've had protégés who will say to me, um, you know, I'll say to my protégés, I want you to go with me. One of them, his name is Jonathan. I met him when I was at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. I told Jonathan that I was invited to the governor's mansion and I wanted Jonathan to be my plus one. And Jonathan said, I have no desire to meet the governor. And I told Jonathan, I didn't ask you that. Because my job as mentor is not to always take you places you want to go. Sometimes the mentor must take the protege to places they don't even know they need to go. But what I knew is that Jonathan aspired, he was a political science major, Jonathan aspired to enter politics, and Jonathan needed to know how to navigate that space, that environment, before he had the responsibility to navigate that space. He needed practice, all of us need practice. So I knew by taking Jonathan, I could have taken anybody I wanted to the governor's mansion, but rather I took Jonathan because I knew that my protege needed this experience. He needed this training. The, the mentor is always thinking about the curriculum. What is it that your protege needs to know? To do that, you gotta always know where your protege is headed. And if you're like me, you realize that the destination changes with time. When I first went to undergrad at the University of Virginia, I was a biology major. I was gonna be a medical doctor. I was gonna be a medical doctor until I shadowed a surgeon who was my uncle and I passed out at the sight of blood. I figured that probably was not the profession for me. And all of a sudden I switched and I started to be a pre-law major because I was gonna to go to law school and I was gonna be a lawyer. And I realized that I was gonna be a lawyer until my faith and my subject matter came in conflict and I realized I don't like lying and I'm not going to commit to a life of lying. I'm not saying that lawyers are liars. I'm just simply saying for me, there were some contradictions. So before you know it, I switched. I ultimately settled on music and religious studies. And now I find myself in education. So my mentors had to keep up with my destination changing. One day biology, next day pre-law, then all of a sudden music and religious studies. So it's an enormous undertaking to be one's mentor. That's why when people meet me all across the country and they say, Dr. Strayhorn, I want you to be my mentor, I say, let's have that conversation. But when people come up to me and say, hey, mentor, I'm like, wait, I didn't even agree. We never even had the conversation because it's an enormous undertaking to be someone's mentor. It means that you're committing to always keeping up with the curriculum. It means that you're committing to invest the time and energy in knowing them and where their head is so that you can help them get there. It also means that you're willing to make decisions like when you go to the governor's mansion, you'll make space for them. Now, interestingly enough, when I took Jonathan, who is taller than me, that's not very difficult to be, um, but he's taller than me. He went to the governor's mansion and when we got to the front door, he's shaking and he's nervous and he said, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. And I knew exactly what to do. So before you know it, before we walked in, before we walked in, I said, Jonathan, what's your name? He told me his name. I shook his hand. I looked him straight in the face. I said, Jonathan, I like your shirt. He said, you already told me that. 
I said, I know, but I'm giving you tips about what to do when you get inside of here. That my script for meeting new people is first of all, look them straight in the face and ask for their name. When they give me their name, I repeat their name. I shake their hand and then I compliment them on something. I've complimented people on scarves that I really didn't like. I've complimented on people on watches that I thought were really, really boring, but I, I wouldn't tell them that I'm from the South. I just tell them, I love your watch. I love your glasses. I love your hair. Doesn't matter because most people start doing exactly what you're doing. That is smiling when you compliment them. And before you know it, we're automatically into conversation. I gave Jonathan that script, I let him try it out on me, and then I said, now when you get in this room, that's exactly what you're gonna use to work this room. I equipped him for the space that I took him into, the job of the mentor is not just to open up the door, but to equip the protege for moving through the space that we're gonna open up to them. Now, I've given you a script, I'd like you to try it. At your tables, name, Hello, straight in the eye, give them a compliment. You've got three minutes, go. As awkward as that exercise may sound or be, what we've learned from years and years of social science research is that most people are afraid of people and it's the introduction of themselves that makes them most uncomfortable. See, we don't know, like, what do I tell first? Do I tell my name? Do I tell my age? Do I talk about this? Is that conceit? We also have a number of cultural clashes that happen. There are cultures that believe that talking about oneself, that somehow that seems to be very self-centered and that's uncomfortable for people, but you also live in a capitalist society where the best thing you could do is talk about yourself. And so you're trying to figure out how to sort through all of this. The mentor is the person who helps the protege make sense of all of these very, very conflicting messages. Part of this is the whole process of education. I said earlier that to me, a mentor is an educator. It's one who specializes in imparting information and knowledge. It's one who specializes in helping students see the light that they have within themselves. A job of a mentor is to help students connect with that light and to draw out the light that's within. In fact, I say all the time in public lectures like this one that the word education in Latin is educare. It means to draw out the light that is within. Now, I would say to educators what I'm gonna to say to mentors and that is every mentor must believe that there is light within the protege. In fact, I kinda of use that as my own criteria or litmus test for whether or not I can agree to be someone's mentor. There's no point in being a mentor to a protege that you don't think has potential. There's no point of agreeing to be a mentor for a protege who you don't think will actually get where they're headed. But if you believe in them and can have high expectations of them, no matter how um, rough they might be in the making, no matter how much work they have ahead of them, but if you believe that there's light there that they can connect with and draw out, I think you're qualified to be their mentor. Now the job is to help them, coach them, advise them how to connect with that light, draw out that light, and use it to get where they're going. Part of that is about setting these goals, and I would say that education, the whole process of education, what they do here at Fresno State, what we do at Lemoyne Owen College, what we do in K-12 schools and beyond, all of it is designed to ultimately help young people set their own internally derived goals. This is so important for mentors to understand that our job is not to give students our goals, but to help them as protégés come up with their own internally derived goals. Most protégés will come with goals that they've got from their mom, their dad, their sister, their brother, their auntie, their uh, grandma, their grandpa. But our job, and some of those goals might be their goals, but our job is to help them figure out which of these are the ones I really wanna pursue. Part of that is this whole goal setting activity. And that is one, helping them realize where are they headed, how will they get there, who will go with them, and who won't go with them, and having honest conversations with them about those decisions, and then finally, what will they do when they get to where they're going? I met a young man in Iowa one time, who, African-American male, tall, not very difficult to do compared to me, he comes up to me, says, Dr. Strayhorn, I've got big ideas. I said, really, like what? He's like, man, my ideas are so big. I said, that's great, like give me an example. He's like, nah, bro, you can't even, like my ideas are so big, you can't even understand them. And I stopped him, I said, then what use are they? If you cannot articulate your idea, if you can't put it into words or draw it on a sheet of paper, that means that 
Oprah can't invest in it. That means that the country can't follow it. That means that people who see your vision, the whole point, it's great to have big ideas, but like Henry David Thoreau once said, now we've got to build uh, foundations under them. And that is give them some strength, give them some shape, give them some form. So the job of the mentor is to have that realistic conversation with the protege to say it's great to look good. I tell my proteges that all the time. My proteges, I usually wear a bow tie. I don't have a bow tie on today, but a lot of my mentees say things like, oh my gosh, when I started having to use my mentor, I fell in love with bow ties. I thought if I could like rock a bow tie, then all of a sudden I'm gonna be on the keynote speaking uh, gig. And I'm like, no, that's not how it works. It's not a bow tie. People don't want to just because of your bow tie. Although a bow tie is nice. I mean, a bow tie looks good. But if you are silly and you have a bow tie on, nobody wants to hear you. But you could be brilliant with no bow tie and everybody wants to hear you. Substance over style is what I try to teach my own mentees. That's the courage of a, pro a mentor who has to have that conversation with the protege, who is on their life course, headed where they're trying to go, but they're, they're starting to make sense or start to um, wrestle with different messages. Should I specialize in style or should I specialize in substance? It's the mentor who has to help them realize, no, it's always substance. It's good to look good. It's good to smell good. It's great to show up on time, but if you show up on time and you have nothing to say, then why do you show up at all? All of that is the job of the mentor, to help the protege set reasonable goals, ultimately, so they can connect with that light that's within and shine that light. I talk a lot about light because I learned about light from my maternal grandmother. This is my mom's mom. My mom's mom, she was born Creola Evelyn Warner. I was thinking about her this morning when I was brushing my teeth um, because, um, well, I think about my grandmother a lot of times. But my grandmother helped raise me. She lived in Trenton, North Carolina. She lived on Highway 58 South. Highway 58 South stretched from like, well, I don't know how far Highway 58 uh, South stretch, but her street might be from like that wall all the way to that building. The interesting thing, well, maybe beyond that building. And the interesting thing about this street was my grandmother lived on one in one house, right beside her sister, right beside her other sister, across the street from their cousin, down the street from their sister-in-law and their brother and their aunt. The only thing that separated these houses were like fields. And so growing up with my grandmother in Trenton, North Carolina, not only did I know all my family, I could see them all almost at once, just stand outside in the yard, look around, and everybody around me was related to me. My grandmother was one of the first people to teach me about the importance of family and connectedness. My grandmother was also a public school teacher. She taught for 52, 54 years before she retired. She retired on a Friday and then went right back to work that Monday as a substitute teacher and she stayed a substitute teacher until death. I told the story last night that my grandmother, when she turned 80, my grandmother made so many sacrifices for me. I played the piano. Um, if there was a piano up here, I would play it. But my grandmother, one day I was in the mall. I'm from Virginia Beach, Virginia. I was in Lynn Haven Mall with my mom and my grandmother. We were walking by stores and like a, I was a I don't know, like maybe nine. And well, I was probably about this height, but I was nine. And you know, when you walk by those music stores and you just want to touch the pianos because they're right there. So I touched one of the pianos inside the music store. Have you ever touched one of those pianos that when you touch one key, it starts playing an entire song for like 15 minutes so the whole mall knows that you touched the key? So I'm walking by the music store and I touched one key and all of a sudden this whole song starts playing. I'm so embarrassed, I just run behind, I put my hand behind myself. My mom turns around, she says, who did that? I said, I don't know. And then my mom said, you're lying. And she was so mad at me because she was so embarrassed. The woman inside the store started coming around to see who touched the piano and see if she could turn it off. And my mom said, why did you touch that? And she was yelling and screaming and the tears were starting to well in my eye. And my grandmother, the master teacher stepped in the middle of my mom and myself and she looked at her daughter, my mom, and said, don't yell at him. And I said, yeah. She said, because she was a master teacher, she said, you know that when you yell at kids, they never listen anyway. Why don't you just talk to him? He's trying to tell you something. I said, yeah. She turned around, looked at me, and she said, baby, do you want to play the piano? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, my mom said, well, why would you ask him that? We don't have the money for a piano. My grandmother said, well, then we'll just have to make a sacrifice. She said, but honey, to learn the piano, you got to take piano lessons. It's going to take practice. Are you willing to practice? Yes, ma'am. 
My mom said, why would you ask him that? We don't have money for a piano. My mom said, my grandmother said, well, I'm just going to have to go to the bank. And I thought, well, we just passed the ATM, so that's cool. But my grandmother didn't mean that. She said, now y'all close your eyes and I'm going to go to my bank. And she went inside her bank. My grandmother went inside that precious bank all my life. She had so much money in that bank. In fact, I remember one time, one, I didn't even care, but I was at a, a grocery store or something. I need a whole lot of money because I was trying to pay something. My grandmother said, well, I got to go to the bank. I thought she meant that bank, but she actually meant a real bank. All my life, that's what a bank was right there in her bosom. My grandmother took money out. Before you know it, she put me in piano lessons. I can play the piano today because my grandmother made a sacrifice when I was nine. That's what mentors do. Mentors understand the kind of skills that the protege needs. Helps connect them to the resources that they need to develop those skills, has honest conversations with them, like you're gonna have to practice, are you willing to practice? And practicing the piano was difficult. And there were days I didn't wanna practice, and quite frankly, in transparency, there were days I did not practice. But ultimately, as my grandmother and my commitment to my grandmother, who was more than just a grandmother, she was a mentor to me too, to my grandmother that calls me on those days when I didn't wanna practice, I would practice sometimes just because I knew I had promised her this. Mentors and protégés have to develop relationships with one another so that when the protégé makes a promise to the mentor, they will, it will actually mean something. I read your lips. It will actually mean something. It will call them to act. That's what Telemachus had in the mentor in Homer's Odyssey, is that the promises he made to his mentor mattered because Telemachus knew that he mattered to the mentor. That's when our spoken promises connect with our personality. It is very easy to break promises to people that we don't care about, people that we don't know and we don't think they care about us, but it's difficult, almost impossible for a human to break a promise to a person that they care about and they believe that person cares deeply about them. I was seven years old in my grandmother's kitchen. She was making bacon and frying eggs and whatever you do, I don't cook. So whatever you do to eggs and bacon, that's what she was doing in her kitchen. It was really, really good. I was sitting on a stool right beside the oven and my grandmother said baby I want to teach you my grandmother was a choir director I'm a choir director my grandmother said baby I want to teach you a song my grandmother taught me like a thousand songs when I was young when she was alive and she said baby I want to teach you this song it's my favorite song I said ma every song is your favorite song she said hush your mouth child now listen I want to teach you this is one of my favorite songs the words to this song are this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine she gave me all the words and then she sang the song. And my grandmother had like a beautiful full voice and she had a smaller home, but her voice could fill her entire house to where you could almost look and to me like the curtains were shaking because of her voice. And she could sing while scrambling eggs and flipping pancakes and never miss a note. And then this particular day when she taught me the words, she sang the words, she said, now, honey, I want you to sing. I said, Ma, I don't sing. She said, you're a young person. You're a kid. You're in my house. Any kid in my house is going to do what I want them to do or they will not eat. I wanted to eat breakfast that day. So before you know it, I started singing this little light of mine. Whoa. Oh, I'm going to let, I said in the whole song. And at the end of it, my grandmother said, you sound terrible. She gave me honest feedback. Sometimes that's what mentors have to do. But she also, she didn't give me bad feedback like you sound terrible and just left me there. In despair, she said, you sound terrible, but you can sound better if you practice. And honey, you ought to practice because you never know when you're going to need that song. A couple weeks later, we were at Free Will Baptist Church in Trenton, North Carolina. That's my grandmother's church. She was the church mother. My grandmother was the choir director. She got up in front of the choir and then turned to her pastor and said, Pastor, do you mind if I do something a little different today? The pastor said, you're the choir director. Do whatever you want. She said, church, I want you to put your hands together for my grandson who's going to come up here and sing a solo. I thought she meant my brother was in town. So I'm looking around for him. She's like, no, Terrell, come up here. I'm like, no, she said, no, no. Before you know it, she says, get up here. I get up there in front of all 61 people at her church. I'm so nervous because I've never stood up in front of people and I've never sang. I only sang in front of my grandmother and I didn't know this was coming. Have you ever been so afraid and so nervous that you forgot everything? I forgot the words. I forgot the notes. I even forgot how the song started. I turned to my grandmother and said, Ma, I don't remember the words. She said, cover the mic, got close to me. This is what mentors do to protégés who are uncomfortable and in uncomfortable situations. We don't abandon them. We get closer to them. Proximity really matters. 
Because when we are close to people who we know care about us, it actually gives us the motivation, the confidence that we need to do what we're about, the task before us, to perform. My grandmother got close, covered the mic and said, this little light of mine, and gave me the words. I said, but I forgot the starting note. She covered the mic again, she hummed the starting note, and she said, now stop playing games and close your eyes and sing for mama. Had she said sing for, I don't know, somebody I didn't know, I would have still been standing there. But when she said sing for mama, someone I know, someone who I know loved me, I closed my eyes and no one would probably believe me, but I felt like I was back in my grandmother's kitchen. I could almost hear the popping of bacon and hear the wood spoon hitting the bowl. And before you know it, I closed my eyes and without hesitation grabbed the mic and said, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. And before you know it, the church was clapping and standing up and my grandmother said, sing the second verse. I said, you didn't teach me the second verse. Because that's what happens when we close our eyes to all of the distractions. Pay close attention to those who support us, who we're connected to, and turn inward to the light that's within. We start drawing on that light, it comes out and it illuminates our darkest moment, our darkest hour. That's what mentors help protégés figure out. That's what I've written about in my scholarship, that part of success in education, part of success in school, part of success in college is not just dependent on how long you study, although studying is important. It's not just about how much you go to see your teacher before class or after class, although that's critically important. Part of success in education uh, for the protege depends on understanding who you are and connecting with people who care about you and finding a sense of belonging. That's what this whole book is about that belonging really matters. It's about being part of a group and finding your group or finding your village, finding your people, connecting with them and a shared faith that somehow by committing to being with committing, promising to be with these people, that your needs will be met. That's what mentors and protégés do. They develop these relationships that offer belonging and acceptance to the protégé and out of that means that their needs will be met. Interestingly enough, in the book, I also connect my research to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. By a show of hands, how many of you in here have ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Good? Maslow says this, that as humans, we all need basic things like air, water, food, shelter, sleep, and sex. Maslow said it, not me. But you gotta get some, and I mean water. Um, because without it, higher order needs like safety and security do not emerge, they do not evolve. Once our basic needs are met and our safety and security needs are met, then love and belongingness matters. I want to say to the young men in the room that making friends is part of your success in school. You cannot get through, and I was one who thought I could. I thought I could get through school. It didn't really matter if I had friends. It didn't really matter if I hung out with people. It didn't really matter if they didn't like me. But before you know it, it does. You have to have supportive communities. Sometimes these supportive communities are in the classroom with you. Sometimes they're people outside the classroom. When you get to college, some of them are in your major. Some of them are outside your major. Quite often, you join a club or organization, not just because you're interested in the thing, in the thing although that's important. You might join student government because you see yourself as a leader and you think that's the best way to activate your skills, but you might also join student government because it puts you around people who are similar or different and that you might form community with them. All of this is connected to the whole essence of belonging and belonging is about mattering. All of us want to belong and the way in which we find belonging is when we feel like we matter. We feel like we matter when we experience four dimensions of mattering through mentoring relationships or even through friendships. And that is, people feel like they matter when they feel like they have people's attention. Have you ever been talking to someone and you knew you didn't have their attention? And you remember how insignificant you felt? People feel like they matter when they feel like they are dependent on people or people need them in order for things to happen. People feel like they matter when they experience ego extension. That is, that other people care about me care about my success just as much as I do. That's what I think a good mentor does. A good mentor gets to know the protege, 
and where they're going in such a way that they convey to the young person that almost you want it as bad as they want it. You want them to get the job almost as bad as they want to get the job. Now, the truth of the matter is this. You can't want it as much as they want it. That's not possible. Because before you know it, it looks like this. The mentor is dragging the protege to get where they're going, and that's not what pro mentoring looks like. But mentoring is always from the side, or always right behind, or always the coach in the margins. And you're echoing, and you're celebrating them, and you're affirming them, and you're challenging them. But ultimately, it is the protege's job to actually get up and go to do it. Lastly, people feel like they matter when they feel important, when they feel like they're the object of other people's concern, or they feel cared about. All of this tracks on to some different patterns. Repeat after me, I'm here on purpose. I belong here. I am enough. And I matter. All right, now you've formed a relationship with the person at your table, so look back at your people at your table. And in a better Fresno State voice, whether you are part of Fresno State or just visiting Fresno State, repeat after me, looking at them, say, you matter. Tell them you are enough. Tell them, contrary, no, you don't have to say that part, just say you are here on purpose. Now tell them you belong here. It's not by accident that all of us came together on this day for this conference. Now, I don't know exactly why you came and why I came and why the cosmos brought us together, but I do know this. I am not only a social scientist, but as a man of faith, I believe there's a reason why we had to meet today. There's a reason why you had to hear this message today. There's a reason why this was the opening of the conference and not the closing of the conference. All of that is by design in my mind. Now, it's part of our job to figure out exactly how does this track on to where we're going and what we're doing in our practice. But I need you to understand, you're not here by accident. You could have been anywhere today, but you decided to be here. You're here on purpose. And not only are you here on purpose, that you actually do matter. It's a great smile, you do matter, yes. And not only that, you know you who just turned his head, you, yes, you matter. You're here on purpose. And that you are enough, contrary to what people tell you, you don't need anything else to be who you are or to where you're going. I spent half my life trying to be somebody else until I figured out that this was my lane and that I should just stay in it. But there was a time where, um, I, don't, I heard other public speakers and I'm like, oh my gosh, I like their voice. So I would start speaking like this. That's not my natural voice. So I would hurt myself trying to talk like this for a whole keynote because I thought that, that ladies and gentlemen, I thought that was great, right? But that's not me. I gotta be myself. And myself is, is sometimes high and sometimes low, but as long as I stay myself, I can operate, I can be myself. I can maximize my performance. I can do what I wanna do, but the moment I start trying to be someone else, my jokes fall flat, my energy is run out, I'm exhausted. The same is true for you. If you're a basketball player, if that is your lane, then perfect that craft. And just because you're a basketball player and you like what the spoken word artist does, the spoken word artist is not your competition. Don't try to be a spoken word artist unless you are one. But if you are the basketball player or you're the scientist, you're the lawyer, you're the mathematician, you're the dancer, you're the actor, stay in your lane and you will find success so long as you stay in your lane. Staying in your lane is really, really important. It's part of what education does. It not only helps you um, stay in your lane, it helps you connect with that light. Now, interestingly enough, this was my favorite shoe to wear back in 2008 to like 2012. If you ever saw me find any video of me speaking back in 2008 around that time, I would have had on the Converse. It's my favorite shoe to wear then. The reason why I don't have Converse on now, because it's not 2008, it's not my favorite shoe anymore. And you gotta understand that your lane has whiffed to it. You know, just because you do something doesn't mean you're gonna do it the same way every single day and every single year. I don't, I don't have a bow tie on, but I'm still speaking. Um, I have a baseball cap on, sometimes I have a tall hair, box fade, uh, sponge curl hair, but I'm still speaking. And I've had to g realize that give myself license to grow and evolve, and to realize that growing and evolving doesn't move me out of my lane. I'm still in my lane, I just look different. My jokes might be different, my stories might be different. My shoes might be different. But in 2008, I wore these shoes, Converse. I remember I got a call. I lived in Knoxville, Tennessee 
in 2008. Area code in Knoxville is 865. I was at home in my townhouse. My cell phone rang. was an 865 number. I knew it was a Knoxville number. But anyone I knew in Knoxville, their phone was saved in my number. I almost didn't answer, but something told me to answer. Have you ever had that where you're like, you normally don't answer the call, but something's telling you, like, answer this call. And when you answered it, you realize it was your best friend. It was somebody, a friend of yours, a family member. I answered it, and it was John Peterson, who was president of the University of Tennessee at the time. He said, hey, Dr. Strayhorn, um, this is John Peterson. And I'm thinking, I don't know a John Peterson. Then it turns out it's the president of the campus. Now I do know a John Peterson. He said, um, we're about to launch a search for our new chancellor. The University of Tennessee is organized into multi multiple campuses. One president for all campuses. Each campus has a chancellor. He said, we're launching a search for our new chancellor of the Knoxville campus, and I want you to be on the search committee. He gave me all the duties. I thought if the president asked you to do something, I guess you should say yes. So I said yes, and I remember some time passed, and then it was time for the first meeting of the search committee. I remember staying at home, and those of you who know me know that sometimes I do this, and I stood in the mirror and I thought, this is a search committee meeting, it's my first one. I don't know what you wear to a search committee meeting. But I wore black pants and a black dress shirt and a black blazer, my favorite thing to wear, all black. And then I had to think about what shoes do I wear. And MC Troy, I didn't know if I should wear like some cool Jordans and some J's. So I was like, no, I don't think you should be able to wear that to the search committee meeting. Then I thought maybe I could wear some dressy shoes I got from Aldo. But then I was like, no, I want to wear my favorite shoe. That's the converse. I stood in the mirror and thought about dress shoes or J's or uh, Converse so long that now I'm late to the meeting trying to fool with my feet. Before you know it, I put the Converse on, but I took my dress shoes in the plastic bags. I thought if I get there and they all look at me crazy, I could change. So I get to the meeting, I park, I go into the meeting. There's only one seat left because now I'm like 10 minutes late to the meeting. I go in, I sit down, I sit down beside a blonde headed woman. I look down on the floor as I get ready to cross my leg. I look over and I'm like, wow, she has a fabulous bag. It was like one of these multicolored bags by, I don't even know who the designer was, but I started wanting that bag. I was gonna steal the bag, but then I thought that's wrong. Don't go to a search committee meeting and steal a bag, and then you're in jail. I just thought the headlines would be all wrong. So I've now lost three more minutes looking at her bag. Now I am exactly what? I don't know, 15 minutes late to the meeting, but I finally look up. We're talking about all the candidates for the position. And all I remember are about two stories. One is we were talking about an African-American man who had applied to the position from Florida. He had a good interview, but uh, it's a long interview to be a president of a campus. It's usually two or three days. They drag you around everywhere to meet with politicians and faculty and students. And I remember the discourse at the table was, I like the guy, but he looked really, really tired. Like, I don't know, kind of lazy. Oh my gosh, who wants a president who's lazy? And I thought to myself, how do you get to be a candidate for a presidency and you're lazy? So before you know it, I raised my hand and the chair of the search committee calls on me. I said, hi everyone, sorry I'm late. Um, I'm Terrell Strayhorn, I'm glad to be here, I like your bag. Um, so I don't know what we're talking about right here, but in graduate school, I took this course on race and racism. And I remember that sometimes, if you're not careful, discourse can be racist. We're using words like lazy and not even realizing that that's racialized because the same behavior in a white person would not be labeled as lazy, but before you know it, we'll discredit this guy who has a really strong resume all because someone said lazy or tired and tired becomes shiftless. And before you know it, we start drawing on these racialized stereotypes about black people. Before you know it, we're on to our next candidate. So I just wanted to call that out. I don't know what's really happened, but it's a really good conversation and I stopped talking. I remember the person is in the room, it was like so quiet, they looked around the room, they said, thank you, Dr. Strayhorn. And by the way, when people say that like that, thank you, that's not thank you. It's like coded language for why are you here, right? What, who, who gave, what, who invited him? And why is he here calling us out on our stuff? So before you know it, the search committee chair said, you know what, I think you're right, Dr. Strayhorn, which is another way of saying, I don't think you're right, but since you're here, we're not gonna continue this conversation. I think we should move to the next candidate. It was a woman out of California, true story. She was fabulous during her interview. Before you know it, people started talking about her and saying things like, well, I don't know, did you see the dress that she wore? Oh my gosh, I did not like that dress. Could you imagine having a chancellor who wears that dress 
dress. Second thing they started talking about was her husband. Oh, her poor husband. Did you see her husband at dinner? He had to sit to the side while she sat at the head of the table. She is the candidate for president, not her husband. And women have done this for decades upon decades to, to men who, who sought their own gain for their professional career. But no one ever said, oh, poor woman. But the moment it's a guy. So before you know it, I'm sitting here and I'm like, oh my gosh, masculinity. As DJ Troy said, MC, I called you DJ, that works too. As DJ Troy said earlier, talking about privilege, men have privilege that you can pursue your career. And heterosexual men who have a woman in their life can have the woman sitting to the side and no one will problematize that. But when the roles are switched, the sympathy is given to the man. So before you know it, I raise my hand, I educate my group again. I said, oh, me again, still Terrell. So I've heard about this too. This is called sexism. I'm not from Tennessee, I'm from Virginia. I don't know what y'all call it here, but in Virginia we call this sexism. And I didn't think we we're supposed to be doing it. And you smile, because if you smile, people don't know if you're cutting or if you're really smiling to them. Before you know it, the chair of the search committee said something like, oh, Dr. Strait, oh my, ooh, you are so, thank you so much for being here. Again, that overdone way of saying thank you for being here is another way of saying you got one more comment and I'm gonna get you out of here, right? I thought the meeting went well. The search committee chair said, you know what, how about this? Let's take a fresh look at all the applications and come back in a couple weeks to discuss them. I thought the meeting went well, so I picked up my bag, almost picked up her bag, and left. And before you know it, as I'm heading out of the room, someone said, hey, you. And I turned around, and it was the woman I was sitting beside. She said, where are you going? I said, I'm going back to my office. She said, stay right there. And before you know it, I'm standing still for a woman I do not know, waiting. Because that's what happens in this society, that if you're not careful and conscious, You'll feel like you owe people an explanation when you don't. You'll feel like you're under their control when you're not. You'll feel like they get to command your movements when they don't. You'll give up your freedom. Even in a free democracy, if you're not conscious and woke, but I'm standing here waiting and still waiting. Before you know it, she passes by me, she says, come on. And now I'm catching up with the woman I do not know who had me wait for 10 minutes. Now she's walking past me and I'm chasing after her. We get out in the hallway, she said, oh my gosh, I thought you were amazing in that meeting. I said, amazing? I didn't do anything except ask a, a couple of questions. She said, I thought you were really strong. And I thought, strong? She said, yeah, in fact, I thought you were courageous. I said, Cor well, I mean, you know, um, so yeah. So before you know it, she said, but I only have one question. When you came into the meeting, I wanted to ask you, but I thought it'd be rude. I said, what is it? She said, what do you have on your feet? I said, these are called Converse. She said, Converse, spell it, takes out a pen to write it down. I said, C-O-N, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who are you who doesn't even know what a Converse is? She said, where'd you get them from? I said, I got them from Journeys. Why? She said, do you think they have any more? I said, I think, I think they have a lot more. Why? She said, come on, I want to get up here. Before you know it, I'm outside following a woman who I do not know to her car. I'm getting into a gold ML350. She sits on the driver's side. I'm now in the passenger seat. She backs up over small children. Just joking, not really. But before you know it, we back up, we take off, we're going down 40 West. I'm sitting in the seat. Have you ever done something and after you did it, you're sitting there thinking, what am I doing and why am I here? I'm sitting there and I could hear my mom and my dad and my grandmother saying, you do not talk to strangers. I am pretty sure they meant don't get in cars with them either. But before you know it, I'm there. Why? Because listen, the currents of life will sometimes push you to go places that you didn't think you needed to go, but you were supposed to. We take the exit at Turkey Creek in Knoxville. We go over, we park, we go into Journeys. I introduce my unnamed new friend to my dealer, dealer of shoes, not drugs. His name is Chris with the K. I said, hey, Chris, what's up, man? Dap him up. I said, this is my friend. I'm sorry, I don't even know your name. She said, my name is D. I said, this is my friend D. D wants a pair of Converse. I just met her and whatever. Before you know it, she buys a pair of pink Converse, the glittery kind. She gets ready to pay for her shoes. I'll never forget this story because I tell it quite a bit. But before she paid for her shoes, she's about to swipe her card. And she said, oh my gosh, where are my manners, Terrell? I didn't get you a pair. And I said, no, 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 I already have like 100 pair of Converse. 
but I will take 101 because, listen, because sometimes the currents of life will push you places you need to go, and when you get there, people will treat you kindly. Why? Because you treat people kindly. Now, if you're going to invest light into the world, the world will give you light back. If you're going to be kind to people, kindness will come back to you. The worst thing you can do for yourself, self-preservation, is to pour out kindness on people and then tell people, no, I can't accept gifts. No, I can't accept hubs. No, not me, you. You sometimes you got to embrace the gifts that life tries to give you. Mentors teach their protégés how to be comfortable with gift giving and gift getting. Part of that is our assignment. So before you know it, I take the converse, I get back to my office, I tell my colleagues, oh my gosh, I met some woman, her name was Dee, she brought me a pair of converse. They're like, wait, what? I said, I don't know her. Her name is Dee. They said, what is her last name? I said, I don't remember it. And they said, do you think her last name was Haslam? I said, actually, I think that is her name. How do you know? They said, Terrell, what is the name of the business school here at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville? I said, it's called the Haslam School of Business. But I don't think that's the same Haslam. They said, no, it is the same Haslam. They said, in fact, Terrell, what's the name of a full ride scholarship here at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville? I said, you're called a Haslam scholar, but that can't be the same Haslam. They said, yeah, it is the same Haslam. Before you know it, here it is. I had found myself in the presence of D. Haslam. Now, you might not know who D. Haslam is, but by a show of hands, how many of you in here have ever watched HGTV? Love it or listen and that kind of stuff. Okay, next time you watch the show, I want you to let the credits run to the end. At the end, the very end, it's going to say powered by Scripps Network. The CEO, founder and CEO of Scripps Network is D. Haslam. D. Haslam, if you know anything about that last name, D. Haslam, Haslam was the former governor of the state of Tennessee. That's a family member. D. Haslam is married to Jimmy Haslam. Jimmy Haslam owns all pilot gas stations in the country. It was interesting. Um, I lived in Ohio for some time. I lived in Tennessee, then moved to Ohio. When I lived in Ohio, the news broke that the Haslams, D and Jimmy Haslam, purchased the Cleveland Browns. They're now the owners of the Cleveland Browns. Before I knew it, the currents of life had pushed me into the presence of someone whose net worth is $16.5 billion. Now I understand why her bag was so cool. I should have stolen it. But before you know it, we exchange numbers. We start talking. I go to coffee with D. I start telling D a lot about myself. I count D as one of my mentors. I didn't go to D and say, D, I just found out your net worth is $16.5 billion. Can you give me five? No, I went to D and said, D, here's, D would ask me questions like, Terrell, where are you headed? She was a mentor. And I would answer her. She would push me sometimes and say, well, I don't think that's a, I mean, that's all you're trying to do? What is your work about? She would push me to have good, solid, convincing answers about that. One day, I made tenure at the T University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Dee says to me, she wants to throw me a party. I said, a party? In my mind, I'm like, a party? I would love some money, but a party's fine. And Dee asked me one day while we were at Panera Bread on Kingston Pike in Knoxville, Tennessee, she said, Terrell, who's your favorite singer of all time? I said, my favorite singer of all time is John Legend. Why? She was like, I have a great idea. Oh my gosh. What if John Legend came to your tenure party? I'm like, that's not even possible. So why would you ask me something like that? I almost unfriended her on Facebook. I'm serious. I was like, that's not even funny. And she said, well, no, I think I might be able to pull it off. And I'm thinking, who are you who could possibly, first of all, you don't even know what converse are, but you think you can get John Legend to be at my tenure party. Before you know it, my tenure party happens. I will never forget it. Lots of people showed up to celebrate my success. My family was there. My friends were there. My grandmother did not make it. However, at some point, Dee stood up in front of folks and told folks that she believed in my dreams. She believed in where I was headed, and she thought that where I was headed was important. And as a result of that, she and her husband were gonna invest in me, and as a result of her public affirmation of my goals and her public announcement that she was gonna invest in me, people who I do not know, but they know D, invested in me. We were able to raise a lot of money. Do you see what I said? I said I wanted money, but she said a party. But sometimes you don't realize that a party will lead you to more money than you can even imagine. But the currents of life sometimes will teach you that. Mentors understand those connections. They have to help protege see it. I thought I had a great party. Everybody was there. I was crying. I, I was all over. We had cake. And at the very end, as we were about to leave, someone wheeled a piano in. I thought, oh my gosh, they know I play the piano. My grandmother made these sacrifices. I'm going to play the piano. And then in walked this guy. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they even got a John Legend lookalike. That would have been 
been cool. That would have been fine with me, MC Troy. But before I got, he got closer and closer and closer, he came up and shook my hand. Before you know it, I realized I met John Legend. He was there. Why? Not because of me. Maybe not even because of D. But D is in media. And as the CEO of Scripps Network, she knows someone who knows someone who knew someone who knew John's schedule, who knew that John was on his way to Cincinnati and would have to pass by Knoxville and could stop by just for a moment. After John shows up, he says he has to leave because he's on his way to Cincinnati. He has a problem. I said, John, what's your problem? He said, I've got to go find some fill-ins for tonight because I've got one alto who's out and one tenor who out, who's out for tonight's concert in Cincinnati. And I said, you need a tenor? He said, yeah. Do you know any good tenors? I said, what? <laughs> well, I mean, I do kind of sing tenor sometimes in the choir. John asked me in the top of the bank in downtown Knoxville, sing something. Listen, if I had said, oh, John, you're silly, don't stop. I would have still been sitting there and he would have left because he doesn't have time for that. John said, sing something. And the only thing, true story, that entered my left, my right ear was my grandmother saying, baby, practice this song because you never know when you're going to need it. And in my left ear, I heard John Legend say, sing something without hesitation in front of everyone. I said, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Before you know it, John said, you're hired, and I went with him that night to Cincinnati, Ohio, not because I'm a singer, not because I'm a rapper, because I'm a professor who made tenure, and at my tenure party, the currents of life connected me with the person who I have the greatest respect for. The moral of this story is not to learn the words to this to the light of mine. The moral of this story, believe it or not, is have the courage to wear your converse. Because if it had not been for the converse, I would have never met Dee. And I would have never met John. And I would have never had this story to tell you that sometimes part of this whole thing called education is connecting you to your story, teaching you how to be present in the moment, teaching you how to speak truth to power. I could have stayed quiet in that meeting, but by speaking up, and having the courage to voice my own, uh, my own story. Conference is mentoring about his story. History, but his story. You have a story. Learn how to tell it. Learn how to tell it well. So that when you get to that space, when you get to that desk, you can show up, be present in the moment, and speak truth to power. And before you know it, whoever it is, you might not be John Legend, but you might find yourself where you want to be. I'm closing with this. This is my grandmother's house. I told you earlier, my grandmother could fill this house with her voice all she wanted. My grandmother had the best voice ever, but this house to me, every time I saw it, when I was a little kid, I'd be like, oh my gosh, we're going to grandma's house. But when my grandmother died, November 23rd, 2013, I stopped going to this house. I didn't go to this house again for three more years. About three years later in 2016, I go to the house, I put the key in the door, I open the door. Every time I opened the door, I could hear my grandmother walking to the front door and she would open the door and she'd say, hey, rail, and she'd give me a big hug and kiss and I'd be so happy. But this time when I opened the door, I knew my grandmother wasn't there, but I could almost kind of still hear her feet. But when I opened the door, she wasn't standing there. When I associated the house with light, this time when I opened the door, it was dark. I always associated warmth with this house, but this time when I opened the door and stood inside, it was cold and empty. And what I realized is this, that what made this place home for me is not the, sh the windows, it's not the shutters, it's not the colors, it's the woman who was in the house. The relationship that I had with her made that house come alive. Part of mentoring is about making sure that we build strong bonds and connections with our protégés that can make any space come alive, make this conference come alive, make the table come alive, make the session come alive, so that ultimately when the student associates you, mentor, with a place, they themselves light up and come alive. Thank you.